If you like drawing portraits, it's likely that you'll have come across the Loomis method by now, which is a very popular and super effective way of getting your head drawings started. If you've been practicing it for a while, you may have noticed also though that it's not always feeling super intuitive and that sometimes it doesn't seem to be the most helpful way to get your head drawings started. So in this video, I want to do a deep dive. Let's talk first about the instances when using methods like the Loomis method or the Riley method for that matter, when that's useful and helpful and when you really want to dive into it deeply. And then let's look at some instances like this over here, these two drawings, where I'm adapting these methods and I will explain to you what my way of thinking is to kind of alter this very rigid system to make it work for the subject matter at hand. Before we dive in, in case we haven't met yet, my name is Carolyn and I'm a practicing artist and teacher. I help artists who are tired of their technical and creative limitations master drawing once and for all so they can enjoy the freedom that comes with meaningfully expressing themselves. If that sounds like you, hit that subscribe button and stay connected. Also, if you're ready to take this one step further and you're really committed to getting past your limitations, I linked a free masterclass in the description below, which will outline to you step A through Z, how to set yourself up for success in your artistic growth. For now, let's get into this lesson. The great thing about having a systematized approach to your portrait drawing like the Loomis method or the Riley method is that of course it gives you a step-by-step -step approach to what to deal with at what point of the drawing. So you don't even have to think about what you should be juggling first. You simply follow the roadmap. And this roadmap helps us establish the shape of the head, the proportions of the head, as well as the three-dimensional structure of the head. Meaning, are we looking up at this head? Are we looking down at it? How is it oriented? As in how far left or right is our model looking? And we establish this information by drawing a sequence of shapes and lines. If you would like my step-by-step -step sequence of how I establish my underdrawing for portraits, watch this video on the top right corner. It's a very in-depth walkthrough of what you should understand. This is not a quick fix, it's in depth. So there's this video and then there's a second video building on top of the first one. So those two will get you to that place that you're seeing me draw right now sped up in a carefully elaborated version. So let's come back to this idea of the Loomis or the Riley method and what their main benefits are. You really want to understand that the main benefit of the Loomis method would be that it's so, so good at explaining to the viewer the 3D elements of your pose. So for example, here you're seeing me draw two central axes of two different spheres. The sphere is the foundation of the head. The cranium is very spherical, so that's how we want to think about the head. And drawing in the central axis forces me to think about whether we're looking up or down at this pose. And then in the Loomis method, we're instantly getting prodded to think about, well, what does the side plane of the head look like? How much of it do we see? How broad is it or how narrow is it? And then right away, we are asked to consider the upward or downward tilt of the head, which we describe with this elliptical line that we wrap around that place where the brows are. So we're instantly describing the 3D elements. How much of the side plane do I see? How much are my rubber bands, these kind of wrapping lines that describe where the brows and the nose and the mouth are? How much are they um, curving or not curving? All this is 3D information. And last, we put in this line, which goes from the top of the ear to the corner of the chin. And this helps us understand where the front of the face ends and the side of the face begins. So you can see how in the second version, using that same information, the same anchor points, just adjusting it for the different head position, we get a really clear understanding of what the pose is like with a very few amount of lines and with a relatively small time commitment. So this is wonderful when you want to draw heads from imagination. You simply want to memorize those landmarks, those proportions, those shapes you should be looking at, and then you alter them depending on what the pose is requiring of you. So on a level head position like this, for example, we understand because of the Loomis method that from the hairline to the brow is an equal distance as from the brow to the base of the nose, and then from the base of the nose to the chin is the same distance yet again. 
It helps us understand where the ear should be. It should always be at the bottom back quarter of the side plane. So no matter how foreshortened the side plane becomes, the ear will always sit in there. So you just find your rhythm from the chin to the ear, and then you have the placement of where the ear shape should be, which is particularly useful when you're trying to come up from imagination with a pose that's a three-quarter view. Now, what I have found in my many years of teaching is that if we stick too strictly to our memorized sequence, that it doesn't really serve us, especially in frontal poses or in profile poses. So whenever you have a model that is in a frontal position, I recommend you to loosen up your grip on that prescribed step-by-step -step sequence. And instead, let ourselves be guided by our understanding that we want to begin with big general shapes first, like here, this big blocky lay-in of just the general head shape, the general hair shape, and where the ears generally are at, and gradually work inwards towards smaller and more particular shapes as well as proportion. So first the big head height to head width, and then incrementally smaller um, proportions, like what's the forehead shape in comparison to the nose length shape in comparison to the upper lip shape. So we begin large and gradually work our way to smaller shapes. So for example, now that I have my overall width of the head, I can whittle down at it and see, okay, how wide is the actual forehead and how wide are the temple snippets? You see, so I begin with a wide shape and then I parcel it down. Same with the hair shape. Now that I have the big blocky hair shape, I chunked it down into those smaller little zigzags on the front. So big shapes first, and those are deceptively simple but actually quite difficult to capture correctly, and then we get smaller and smaller. It's the same thing when you're drawing a tree out in nature. You begin with a lumpy, blobby, gestural shape, then you get the overall poofs for where the um, foliage lumps are, and then you whittle those down, and at the very end, you add the texture. So big in general first, and then we get gradually more specific, and not abruptly, but gradually. So biggest, slightly smaller, slightly smaller, slightly smaller, and so on. You get it, right? So if we continue on now with this portrait, you can observe this principle in action where I'm not jumping to drawing the nostril and the eyelids at this point. I'm just gradually um, zeroing in on the slightly smaller shapes and proportions. And because I have studied methods like the Loomis and the Riley method, I know now which landmarks and which anatomical structures to deal with first, second, and third. So I'm still following the sequence, but much more loosely and much more organically. I'm basically responding to what my subject matter is presenting me with rather than trying to being all fixed and trying to force it into submission to fit the step-by-step -step sequence. And here's the real discipline or the real skill that you as an artist should have. As you're going through the sequence of establishing your proportions and your general shapes and getting the general shapes to become more specific, how often do you pause, lean back, zoom out, and assess if what you've currently put down is accurate? And how much do you want to rush on to get out of the discomfort and keep telling yourself, well, I'm drawing, so therefore I'm actually doing the right thing. The pausing and the assessing and the moving of a line over and erasing and adjusting and stepping back yet again, that is the true artist's work rather than just blindly following a, well, I did step one, two, and three, and now I should be done. That approach is not quite as sensitive to what life is presenting to you. So let's draw a second frontal pose and let's slow down the process. And what I want you to understand is that frontal poses in general are more flat. And as I mentioned earlier on in the video, the whole Loomis method approach and the Riley method approach, they're all about bringing out that three-dimensionality. So what if the pose by nature isn't offering us those opportunities for three-dimensionality? Well, then we just need to shift the focus and stress the flatness for that matter. So what am I doing here? First, I'm blobbing out the 
big general placement of where I want my portrait to be. It's just kind of ovals. And I talked about this in a figure drawing video where how you can get started with just using ovals. So once I have the general head shape, the general bun shapes, I also looked at the biggest outer shape created by let's say four to five big angles connecting the outermost points that you see from the left bun to the left top of the head, right top of the head to the um, right outside bun and how it's almost like a triangle, right? Once I have this big enveloping shape, I then look at some very particular zones. I look at the center line. Where is the true center of the face? Once I have that, I look at where are my landmarks? Brow ridge in particular, base of the nose, like not the tip of the nose, the base of the nose. Um, where it, are the lips placed? Where is the chin dome placed? Where does the forehead become the temple zone? What does the hair shape look like in comparison to the forehead shape? So see, those are still big shapes. I'm not talking about individual eye shapes yet with the particularities of how big the iris is versus the white of the eye, etc. At this point, it's really just the biggest shapes. I went from the outermost big shape of just the entire head, including buns, to gradually smaller. What's the shape of the bun uh, on the left? What's the shape of the overall face? And then within that face, I went gradually smaller, but not just willy-nilly, I went from the center out. Because as you may know, our faces are pretty symmetrical. And if you, let's say, just draw the left eye first, however general, then you move on to the chin and then to the nose and then to the right eye later on, they will feel disconnected. So all the shapes that I put in there, I make sure that I mirror the other shape right away. So whether that's the mouth corners or the eyes or the noses, we want to deal with things in pairs. And once my bigger subshapes are symmetrical and they feel like they're capturing the likeness of the model, then because we're dealing with this more flat um, pose, I allow myself to get into shadow shapes. The shadow shapes are flat by nature too. They become, a, they become a pattern. And me plotting those shapes out is going to help me see whether those big sub shapes, like the forehead, the temple zone, etc., whether they're accurate. And what, as you might notice, at this point, I'm not pressing very hard. All of this is still erasable. And that is really the key. I mentioned that earlier in the previous frontal pose. The trick, not the trick, that's the wrong word. The discipline that we artists need to get really good at is assessment. Pausing many, many times during the process, zooming out, leaning back, and truly with an objective I gauge and judge if what we have is hitting the mark or whether we need to adjust. And when we do need to adjust, not beat ourselves up for it and go down go down that rabbit hole of self-berating. Uh, it's very tempting to do that, but it's much more helpful and effective if we stay very neutral and just kind of notice widths compared to heights and angles and... Um, just abstract shapes. So once my abstract shadow shapes feel good and I feel like the likeness is on point, then I allow, I allow myself to push the darks darker. So now I am, as you may notice, beyond the Loomis method portion of my portrait because I have established what the Loomis method would do for us. I've established my shapes. I've established my proportions and I've established whatever three-dimensionality I can um, tease out of this portrait. And now that I have what the Loomis method would give me usually, I go into value work. Now, if you want to learn more about value work, I have a whole video about that, which I'll put in the right corner as well, because that deserves its own deep dive. So what we're seeing me here do is really just push the values, push my core shadows, push some accents, and also decide where do I want to use the value, the, the, the shadows that I'm seeing on this portrait to create 
the illusion of form, of volume and three-dimensionality, and where do I want to emphasize the flatness? So I'm bringing this up because, again, whenever I'm dealing with flatness, I'm going away from even having to think about the Loomis method. I am really just thinking about patterns. Uh, what is the shape of the left bun and how is that different from that darker hair shape on the top of her head and how is that shape different from the lighter value shape on the top of her head. So that becomes a matter of seeing shapes and treating them as puzzle pieces that interlock with each other. Now, of course, I am still being informed by what I've learned in the Loomis method by understanding the different plane changes. For example, where does the front of the face end and the side of the face begin? That informs how I model my forms with value. But it's sitting more at the back of my mind as I'm drawing and not in the forefront where I'm drawing out those heavy lines. And like that, I get to focus on the expressive nature of my mark making and make this a portrait that reflects my own sensibilities. So the last image that I wanted to walk through with you is one that's a profile view because Profile views, just like frontal point of views, are by nature very flat. They lose that sense of volume because of how the face is um, angling away from us. So in terms of process, here's what's going through my mind. I am laying in the drawing with just some very general blobs, establishing how big things are and how they're angling. So how big is the hair shape that's on top? How big is the headband, the hair that's snuck to the head, and the actual face shape? So in general, in a profile, we can treat the face as this triangular guitar pick-like shape. And then the neck is um, kind of like the slanty cylindrical shape. Um, so you want to look pose by pose. How much is it slanted? Most of the times it's not just straight up and down. Once I have that and I am happy with just the general blobs, I become a bit more particular about their actual shapes. And you can see me using angles to get that particularity to come out a little bit more. And so that is where a lot of the likeness actually comes into play. Now, if you feel like my portrait isn't looking like the model, it's usually hinging on these very simple blocky shapes and you misjudging the height to the width in a certain place. Once you have it, then I go into the next phase, which the Loomis me method does the same thing, which is establishing your proportions. And I take the frontal line, which is our our center line, and along that frontal line, I am plotting out how much space to reserve from the hairline to the brow, brow to the base of the nose, base of the nose to the bottom of the chin. So that is what the Loomis method does. And as I'm happy with those big proportions, I then parcel it down into smaller shapes. For example, the brow to the eyeball, the eyeball to the wing of the nose, the wing of the nose to the ball of the nose, the upper lip, the lip itself, the lower lip, the lower outside wall of the lower lip, and the chin dome. And as I do this, I of course use other drawing tools that every artist should know about, like alignments and negative spaces. So that's not something that we necessarily um, hear about when we read the Loomis method. But this is something that every artist should have in their toolbox. So once I have used these tools, the kind of the procedure from the Loomis method with all these other tools like alignments, etc., then um, I can allow myself to move into building the values by looking at the shadow patterns. I can then make stylistic choices. How much do I want to make this drawing look three-dimensional? Where do I want to bring out that 3D nature? And where do I want to flatten it out? And do I want to play maybe a linear contour element? against this value work that I'm doing? And where do I want to just let it dissolve into just the active, energetic quality of like an exciting mark? And see, 
um, this becomes then very personal. And this is where your style starts to come out. And this is where the exciting work really happens that would never happen if I only stuck to the rigid outline of the Loomis method. So again, once we have our shapes and proportions and the 3D structure in the places where we want it, you then want to become receptive to inspiration, for lack of a better word, receptive to the creative process talking back to you. And this always depends on what your subject matter is up to, what the lighting is up to, and every day you'll get a different answer and you would totally miss out on that if you only were looking for a prescriptive method of drawing. So I hope this video has helped you understand that these systematized ways of going about your portrait drawings are super helpful and that at the same time we don't want to be so rigid and get stuck on them. And hopefully this has expanded your way of approaching your portrait drawings. Now I'm curious, let me know in the comments below, what is your way of going about your portrait drawings? And if you're ready for some more hands-on guidance, I invite you to watch that free masterclass at a link in the description below that helps you understand how you can get to a place where you can create drawings that you truly and absolutely love. As I said, it's in the description below. It's absolutely free. I'd love for you to benefit from it. And I will see you in our next video.